Good morning and welcome to World of Ideas, a program produced by the Metropolitan College, the Adult Education Division of St. Louis University. Good morning. I'm jo George Friesen, Director of Continuing Education at St. Louis University. I'd like to welcome you to the World of Ideas. This morning we're going to talk about a topic which I think is, is really intriguing. Uh, it's, it's a topic that has to do with ways of getting the community much more actively and vitally involved in the schools and vice versa than they really have been in the past. In one sense, what we're going to be talking about with, with our guest this morning is uh, as old as apprenticeships, but in another very real sense, it's quite new and, and I, I would say all too rare. Our guest this morning is, is Bill Hampton, principal of McClure North High School in the Ferguson Flores and School District, author of a new book called uh, solving problems in secondary school administration, a human organization approach. And Bill is also, based on my own experience uh, with him as a colleague for a number of years, a master teacher, if I could add that. Uh, one section of Bill's book describes uh, community learning programs, some highly creative ways of dealing with uh, the resources uh, in the community and the education of youth. Certainly at a time of increasing public expectations regarding accountability, and far too many defe defeated tax levies, programs that can really bring the community and the school closer together assume a very special kind of importance. Bill, well, welcome to the World of Ideas. Thank you, George. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I guess one of the first things I'm interested in is, is, is what uh, a community learning program is. How would you define it? Well, in a most general sense, it's a, the school serving as a broker for a family and community or business agencies. We set up a connection between a high school student and almost any community resource that he might be interested in and work out a contract situation that would involve that student interacting with that business or that agency for a period of time with very clear-cut objectives and a clear-cut plan uh, spelled out. Uh, it's really a very exciting idea and it's a very simple one. Uh, uh, it's really nothing more than a small apprenticeship for a short period of time where for a portion of the school day for a certain number of weeks a student can get a, uh, an in-depth experience in an occupational area or with a career that he thinks he might be interested in. What, what really spurred your interest in, in this approach to education? Well, I think it grew as I spent I've spent 20 years in public high schools and uh, most people I think today uh, I'm not sure are aware of the changes that have occurred in comprehensive public high schools. Uh, when I was uh, in high school and uh, certainly in 1920 or go back to 1900, high schools were essentially college prep institutions and most students dropped out long before high school graduation. Uh, as few as 20 or 30 years ago, uh, only 30, 40 percent of the adolescents graduated from high school. Today, 80 or 90 percent of the American youth are in high school. And so we're trying to deal with a much broader array of uh, talents and interests and abilities, and not all of whom is directed to uh, college and academics, but are more interested in careers, exploring the job, uh, the job place, and uh, it's, it's a more uh, complex and a much more difficult job. I think along with that, a uh, larger number of youth staying in school, it's helped create what I guess we've come to know as the youth subculture. Mm -hmm. You get adolescents, uh, not many years ago, would have been out in the job market at 14 years old, uh, interacting with adults and earning real money for real work. And uh, now we have youth for a longer period of time remaining in institutions that are somewhat artificial. Uh, denying those young people the chance to really be responsible. And I think it's helped to create a lot of isolation uh, on the part of youth, uh, preventing them from interacting with adults and older people in the community that would, uh, I think, make them uh, feel more secure. One of the things you mentioned in your, in your book, Bill, if I could read just very briefly from it, is a, is a quote from Yuri Bronfenbrenner uh, in which he says, if the, if the institutions of our society continue to remove parents, other adults, and older youth from active participation in the lives of children, and if the resulting vacuum is filled by the age-segregated peer groups, we can anticipate increased alienation, indifference, antagonism, and violence in the part of the younger generation in all segments of our society. Uh, I guess I'm curious of a number of things concerning that quote. Uh, uh, 
including uh, your thoughts on, 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 on uh, just a reflection of what Brock and Brenner are saying there as it applies to the school. Uh, what, what kind of social factors do you see as having contributed to this age segregation that, that he describes? Well, certainly it's, a, it's very complex, but I think primarily it's a matter of economics. The uh, working world simply uh, right now, the job market is not ready for young people. They won't accept them. Most uh, jobs available to 16-year-olds would be just working in fast food operations. Uh, some fortunate young people may get better jobs. But at the age of 14, uh, jobs just simply are not available unless you, you can go out and cut lawns and maybe deliver papers. Uh, not very many generations ago this wasn't true. Mm -hmm. At a very young age, you could get into an apprenticeship kind of relationship with a skilled adult. And uh, young people today, by law, in fact, are denied that. The child labor laws back in the 19th century uh, maybe was the very beginning of this isolation of young people from the working world and from the adult society. And it's increased, I think, since that time. Now, the child labor laws were uh, maybe necessary because children were abused in the 19th century in the factories. and. But uh, certainly today, we're far past anything like that. I think it's time to uh, renew creative ways of bringing uh, young adolescents into meaningful contact with adults and with uh, real working situations and not uh, try to isolate them so completely in school settings. A lot of the close connections that really used to exist and the chances for close kind of uh, interaction between younger people and, and people who are a little bit older simply don't exist anymore. Certainly, not even within the family. Uh, many, many young people in uh, my high school, for example, do not have uh, weekly or even any contact with their grandparents. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a tragedy that families have become so fragmented. Uh, and this sense of the extended family, uh, I think, in the uh, older times, uh, did help dissipate a lot of rebellion, which is probably healthy and natural on the part of an adolescent. And while he rebelled against his grandparents 30 or 40 years ago, he, I mean, against his parents, sure. he could go to other members of his family and get assistance in growing up. But today, it's a little more difficult for families. I think it's under a lot of stress. Do you think this age segregation also does something to contribute to uh, perhaps uh, uh, some, some unreal, un unrealistic expectations on the part of youth concerning what the adult world is like? Oh, I think very much so. Uh, the amount of information that... Uh, people within a family have about each other sometimes is uh, amazingly sparse because we'll have uh, parent conferences at school with a mother and a father and a child and maybe our community learning sponsor and the uh, young man or woman will say I, I think I'd really like to be uh, an engineer or I think I'd really like to be an auto body repairman and so often parents will say you've never said that to me before uh, so apparently there is a need uh, to help parents and adolescents uh, communicate much more uh, frequently about their dreams, their desires, some of their uh, ideas about the future. And that kind of communication maybe doesn't go on. I don't know what it is. Television, uh, maybe it's just the antagonism that naturally exists between adolescents and parents that blocks communication. I don't know. But the school, we found at school that we can facilitate communication between the parent and child if we set up the right kind of conference and begin to explore uh, really concrete educational objectives. Mm -hmm. There is, uh, I'm sure, a, a kind of, there's certainly a role barrier between teenagers and parents. I think that all parents have experienced, and since all of us were teenagers, we can remember ourselves the kinds of feelings that we had at one point in our life about our parents. I, I remember myself. Uh, my mother, I hope, doesn't watch this, uh, uh, but that at a certain point in my life, I, I was intensely embarrassed about my parents and thought oh, that, uh, you know, it was just uh, uh, that they were in incredibly slow. And, and, and uh, well. I, contact with other adults at that point in my life, I think, uh, was, was very important because of my own... I think parents have a lot of trouble with it. Uh, there's an old public relations slogan that I've never forgotten. The smaller the child, the larger the hope. <laughs> and uh, when the child is small, I think parents uh, have all kinds of dreams and expectations, hoping the child exceeds their achievement. But when they move into adolescent, and uh, maybe the dream they had when they were younger is not quite coming out the way they thought, the child doesn't appear to be what they wanted them to be, uh, a lot of... Uh, 
I think some of those expectations are lost. And the parents, I think, begin to look upon adolescence as being inept. And that's where the adolescents say so often at school, my parents are always hassling me. And I always remind them they love you. Mm -hmm. And they don't mean to hassle you. It's just that they're worried about you. And they want their expectations to be fulfilled. It's just that you don't know what those expectations are. And it's really important to find out, find out what those are. We're going to be back in right. just a moment. We're going to take a one-minute break. Please stay with us.